It's Psychology 204 with Dr. Richard W. Husband. And here now is Dr. Husband. We were talking on Wednesday about uh, various personality tests. There are others besides the ones that I mentioned that I'm not going into detail on. For example, we have tests on dominance, tests on uh, social intelligence, on fair-mindedness, and certain other ones. By the way, I'd like to say that I'm sorry that um, these tests are not available through the college. We got quite a response when we spoke about the strong vocational interest test, but we can't furnish any service on some of these other others that I have mentioned. I would like to uh, make an announcement for the benefit of the people who are taking this course for uh, uh, credit. The examination, as you know, is going to be Thursday evening at 7 o'clock in the same room you had the midterm, the uh, assembly room in Marston Hall, or quite commonly known as Engineering Hall. And that's the same uh, room the campus class at this hour will also be having its examination in. The examination will consist of 125 multiple choice questions. There will be about 40 general review questions covering the whole book. It will be of rather broad nature. Then the, the other 85 will be on material since the midterm. 85 on the material since the midterm and 40 broad ones covering the whole uh, course. I'm going to have a general review section Thursday afternoon at 3.30, and that will also be in the assembly room of Marston Auditorium. And if any of you uh, uh, people wish to come in to Ames a little bit early and uh, uh, hear the book uh, reviewed chapter by chapter, opportunity for you to ask questions, just come in anytime you want to. You can, if you can't make it 3.30, drop around at 4 or 4.30. You may miss some of the early chapters, but come in whenever you want to. And also, for those of you who may have uh, missed a uh, class or two, I will have my complete notes in the office before 3.30. So if you wanted to come in maybe 2.30 or 3 o'clock if you missed one or two, probably you can look over my typewritten notes uh, in 10 or 15 minutes for each class you missed. Just come in any time after 2, let's say, for that. Well, all right. Uh, today, we're going to deal with a couple of social problems. This parallels chapter 16 in the textbook. The uh, two problems which we're going to deal with today are those of marriage and delinquency or criminality. Uh, from a practical standpoint, perhaps neither of these will apply to you. I imagine a pretty good share of the listening and viewing audience is already uh, married, and when I... Uh, say some things about picking out a mate may not be very practical for uh, a lot of you. And it is a little more practical for most of the uh, students here in the campus of college age. And I hope for neither the students here nor the audience outside will you come too close in too close contact with criminality. At any rate, it's very interesting to look some of these things over. Now, we know that there's a very rapidly rising divorce rate. Somewhere around one marriage in three to one marriage in five uh, ends in a breakup. That's much greater than it used to be in, let, in, let's say, your father's or grandfather's time. Now, I wonder why. Now, we may grant that it may be better in some rare instances to get divorced than to uh, spend a whole lifetime of unhappiness just to avoid getting divorced. But it seems to me that you could pin down the causes of divorce into two general uh, classes. Uh, one of them, uh, that the person didn't get the right mate, and the uh, second, that uh, he perhaps was not a right mate himself in that he didn't try to make a success of the marriage. In fact, the author of the text has got a, a very good uh, statement uh, Rue says this, that successful marriage depends both upon finding the right person 
and being the right person yourself. Now, the last half, I think, has got real food for thought. I think an awful lot of the divorces that occur nowadays are because a person runs to a divorce lawyer uh, the instant there's a little bit of friction. If things don't go right to his or her satisfaction, uh, without any effort to make an adjustment, he will uh, seek a divorce. Now, you work in your job, you try to think how you can do your job better, you wonder what your employer or your boss wants, you try to please him, you think of your job and try to improve yourself constantly. If things aren't going well, you take stock of yourself. Well, why not uh, in the marriage uh, uh, situation? Now, <clears throat> once in a while, somebody might, uh, might ask about us uh, as follows. Well, about picking the right mate, uh, uh, oh, th this is an emotional problem. This isn't like choosing a job where I can uh, take tests and uh, find out my aptitudes. Uh, and personality traits and uh, so on. Uh, uh, I fall in love with some girl, uh, even if she's uh, uh, somewhat different from me in her background and so on, what am I going to do about it? Well, this is the way I feel about that, that um, uh, if you look into a thing when you're beginning to get pretty interested in somebody and realize that their background or their personality traits are so much different from your uh, own, that uh, chances aren't too good of a successful marriage. You can uh, uh, stop it and keep it on a level of friendship, but uh, just hold yourself back from uh, uh, falling in love. Now, we have an old proverb that opposites attract. Well, of course, we know that's true in the field of uh, magnetism, uh, gravity, and uh, so on. But uh, it is not true in the field of personality matching or uh, in marital happiness. Uh, I'd like to revise that and put it this way, that opposites do not attract, but opposites may temporarily fascinate you. That is, uh, let's say uh, a college student is uh, majoring in what we call industrial economics on this campus, or it might be called business administration on another campus. Now, his, he's going into business and his primary aim um, is in a money-making field. Now, suppose he meets some girl who's rather aesthetically inclined, or perhaps this girl is going uh, into nursing or into social work as an occupation, or at least she's taking training along those lines prior to getting married. Well, now, if she's going into nursing or social work, uh, she's in a, in a field that where doing good to other people rather than making money yourself is the important uh, aspect. Now, you may think it's, it's real swell when you m meet a girl that has this uh, very different personality from uh, uh, yourself and uh, she attracts you very much, but in the long run, I think you'll find that there are enough fundamental differences so that uh, um, you wouldn't uh, get along very well for a lifetime. Now, you might ask, where can we get data on the proper marriage partner? Well, uh, data that you may use yourself comes from uh, studies of people already married. Now, there's one study which was done by Dr. Turman of Stanford University. He's one I mentioned before when he talked about these very gifted children. And what he got was this. He got uh, 200 uh, happily married couples, uh, 200 uh, unhappily married, but ones which still stayed married. And then finally, he got 200 divorced couples. And he only used people where he was able to get both partners of that broken marriage. If one of them was available, but the other was now living in a distant state, he didn't uh, uh, get just the one person, but he, he used just pairs. Well, now what he did, he gave these people thorough interviews, questionnaires, he didn't use tests, but uh, all kinds of things concerning uh, marriage and uh, family and children and finances and education and age at marriage and a whole lot of other things. and. Uh, uh, 
on the basis of the results he got, he built up what was called a happiness scale, that where you got a certain number of points for uh, certain psychological factors. Now, for example, <coughs> outside of the home and outside of the work, working day, uh, what does a man and wife do? Now, suppose uh, they say, well, uh, we, we go bowling together once a week. We both belong to the same card club. Certain things like that. Well, now suppose they indicate that all their outside interests, which in college we'd call the extracurricular activities, that all of them are in common. Now, that couple would get seven points toward his happiness score. Suppose they said that most interests were in common, they'd get five points. They did some things together, but some things separately. Some in common, three. Very few, one. And none whatsoever would give a uh, zero score. Now here's one. Settlement of disagreements. Suppose you say that you generally give in. That is zero for marital happiness. You make the other person give in, that's two points for, for you. If it's give and take, uh, you score five points. Well, uh, here are a couple more. Suppose you had the, your choice of living your life over again. Would you marry the same person? If you say yes, 10 points. If you say you'd get married but be a different person, that's zero. If you say you'd remain single, that is zero also. Well, all in all, oh yes, here's one more. Uh, complaint score. How many things about your uh, uh, husband or wi wife annoy you? They can be little trivial things, uh, like table manners or um, dropping ashes on the carpet in the living room and things of that sort. And uh, we just total up all these complaints that you mention. If you don't mention any, there, there's 13 points. If you only mention one or two, 11. If you mention between three and nine, nine points. So on down the line until you, if, you, if you have 30 points, 30 complaints, there uh, is zero on uh, that particular item. Well now, the par on this course is about 70. Uh, in other words, all the points added together, we find that these, uh, these happily married couples will score 70 points. Now, what we can do in looking over marital factors is to examine all factors that might contribute to happiness and see uh, people who satisfy some of these uh, uh, points, see whether um, their happiness score is over 70 or under 70. If it's over 70, they're very happy. So whatever we're talking about probably contributes uh, to it. Now, just as one sample, uh, age at marriage. Now, it's commonly thought that you're much happier if you're married when you're real young. Now, actually, this survey of these 600 couples divided into the end of the three classes showed that it didn't matter, with one exception, those who got married under the age of 21, that is, when both were under 21, were inclined to have an unhappy marriage. They probably rushed in a little too fast, uh, didn't know each other well enough. But actually, if two people 35 years old got married, their happiness score was just as great as people who were 22 or uh, 23. Of course, age differences is another thing. And Terman found in this survey that up to 10 years age difference, there wasn't uh, any appreciable lowered happiness if, say, people aged 30 and 20 got married. But if a man 50 married a girl of 20, there uh, was a lowered probability of their uh, getting along. Well, uh, <coughs> what about children? Here's one uh, quite commonly. They say um, if a couple is not getting along very happily and they don't have any children, they say, well, you ought to get a little cherub in the home and to spread happiness and uh, you'll, you'll, uh, your marriage troubles will, will end. Now, that is not true. Uh, here's the, the case, that it's agreement about children that counts, not whether you've got children or not. If you each want six children, all right. If you've got six, you'll both be happy. If you each want two, you've got two, you'll be happy. If you don't want any and you don't have any, you'll be happy. But it's where, let's say the, the woman wants five children, the man doesn't want to be bothered with any, that one or the other is going to be unhappy. Um, well, of course, that's the kind of thing you can talk over before marriage. And uh, a lot of people uh, feel that's kind of a delicate subject to talk over before they're married, but 
That ought to be settled just as you arrange a business partnership before you open up a store or whatever kind of enterprise you uh, go into. Well, uh, happiness of the parents' marriage is, is a good predictor of happiness in your own. For example, uh, uh, if you see a girl and her parents get along fine, all right, the chances are that she'll make a more stable life. The, uh, the divorce rate among uh, children of divorced parents is high. Now, please understand that I'm not saying that any of these things are necessities. I'm not saying you marry a girl whose parents are divorced that she won't stay with you. Maybe she will. Maybe you'll have the most wonderful marriage uh, you could uh, imagine. But uh, we're dealing in probabilities. And if you get too many probabilities against you, uh, you better, well, control your falling in love before it gets too late. Uh, what about emotional stability? Well, as pointed out by quite a number of the uh, authorities on this subject, a marriage does not settle problems. Uh, it may settle one or two. But actually, having to cooperate with another individual in as close quarters as man and wife, problems are accentuated. You get more problems married than single. Maybe you solved three and you got ten new ones uh, on your hands, so you got seven more and you had uh, to begin with. So marriage shouldn't be entered into as an escape. Some people do it. Well, uh, we've already seen one factor, agreement and disagreement on uh, interests and activities. Now, education. Well, it's found that the happiest marriages, those where they have uh, 70 points or more, are where people have roughly about the same educational levels. That is, both college graduates, both high school graduates, both went partway through high school or something of that sort. Uh, naturally, don't get too particular as to the total number of years. But if there are vast differences, such as, let's say, uh, a doctor with all his years of education marrying somebody who didn't even get beyond junior high school, you might uh, uh, run into some uh, uh, trouble. But middle level is tied up with education. Somebody may be pretty bright and not have gone beyond high school, and they may be okay married to a college graduate or a, a professional person. Well, sex instruction and uh, knowledge of sex prior to marriage came in, and it was found that those who'd had some straightforward uh, sex education given by a proper person, such as a parent, if well informed, a uh, doctor, maybe a minister, there are a number of other sources of uh, straightforward sex information that those individuals in general made a better adjustment to marriage. And then uh, you notice I'm talking about a lifetime of marriage, not just uh, the first few days uh, after marriage. Well, uh, length of acquaintance is another interesting thing. Uh, they found that people who'd known each other two years or more before marriage did have happier marriages in general. Now, that doesn't necessarily hold. Actually, I could take some of you fellows in front of me here and just pick out a co-ed at random around the campus, and you might have an awfully happy marriage. But uh, uh, you might not also. Uh, the more you know, a, the better you know a person, the longer you've known him or her. Uh, naturally, the more you realize your interests are either compatible or uh, incompatible. Well, uh, the last thing we might know, two more things. One is family background. Now there, it's a matter of similarity. That is, after all, uh, uh, we've got around this college a great many people from uh, farms and smaller towns. And suppose they meet somebody from a city. Now, if a girl has always lived in the city and has moved out to a farm, she may be rather lonely and some of the chores bother her. Here's one case I read. Uh, um, in an article by Dr. Paul Popino of Los Angeles, who's one of the leading authorities in the country on this subject, runs a marriage clinic. Very uh, bright, well-balanced man. I've met him and know that he's a fine authority on this subject. Well, Dr. Popino quotes this case. On a college campus, a boy and a girl became acquainted. The boy came from a farm in Indiana where uh, his mother worked pretty hard. In fact, his mother uh, milked the cows and did a lot of things like that. Well, the girl he met came, came from a wealthy southern family where the, the women did almost no uh, hard work 
where she had maids. She didn't even pick her own stockings up off the floor. Well, after they got back from the honeymoon, why, he hands his bride a milk pail at five in the morning. <laughs> you can imagine what happened with that. Uh, now, one last thing, and that is uh, income. Now, the wealthy are traditionally uh, all playboys and girls and uh, get a lot of divorces. That actually is not true according to this study, at least of the 600 couples studied. The, the thing that, that made the difference was one's expectation of money. That is, if you've been raised on a modest income, uh, you're satisfied with that modest income in your uh, mature life. Uh, but the friction comes where there are differences, just as it did in the case with uh, uh, children. If one couple wanted a lot, of one of a couple wanted a lot of children, the other didn't want any, there's friction. Well, if one of a couple wants a lot of money, or this is more important, is a spendthrift, and the other is rather prudent in regard to his money, that is where the friction comes in. If they're both prudent, they get along fine. I don't know about both being spendthrifts. I <laughs> suppose they'd be happy going into bankruptcy. Uh, religion is one other matter, and there again we run into similarities, uh, especially with some of the religions where uh, it's more than a Sunday morning matter, but where it's a matter of conduct uh, through the week and uh, family affairs and education of children and so on. Uh, for example, we find a much greater divorce rate where, let's say, a non-churchgoer marries let's make an extreme, uh, a very devout Catholic, because we get not only the religious matter uh, right in early marriage, but later on when the children become of school age, there's a, uh, a problem. And uh, uh, that's, that's where the rub comes. Uh, if uh, uh, neither is too serious about the religion, differences there, of course, won't become serious. Well, I think we've taken all the time we should at this, and I'd like uh, the rest of the time today to refer to the criminal. This is a rather abrupt uh, change. But we can ask some questions and dispel a few fallacies about the, um, uh, the criminal. To begin with, lots of times we hear this term, well, he's the criminal type, or he looks like a criminal. Is there any such? Well, no. Uh, actually, you get criminals who are as well-dressed and as nice an appearance as a city banker or a minister. Uh, you walk into a post office and so see some of these ads wanted, particularly where you run into the confidence men and embezzlers and swindlers, you will see some pretty well-dressed men, nice-looking men, look as responsible as any leader in a uh, city community. Uh, on the other hand, people perhaps who commit uh, murders of physical violence, uh, or other crimes of physical violence uh, may not uh, be quite as good in their general appearance. But you certainly can't spot them just by taking uh, photographs. Well, I remember one time when I was taking a course in psychology in college, we had put on the board a slide. And uh, here was a group of about 20 people. And the instructor said, look over those faces and tell me how many of the 20 you think are criminals. Well, I looked him over here. This one looked pretty tough, and this one looked as if you couldn't trust him, and so on. Now, I ended up with about 12 or 14 of that 20 I thought were criminals. And then after we'd all written our estimate down, and he asked us the numbers, and then he started to laugh. And he said, you know what that was? That was a picture of a group of United States senators. <laughs> well, <coughs> what about some other factors here? Say intelligence. Is a criminal stupid? Well, actually, there we get um, a distinction between one type of crime and another. Uh, the person who does commit the crimes of violence does have, tend to have a low intelligence level. But actually, swindling and confidence games and things like that call for as much cleverness as succeeding in business. In fact, it's been pointed out that if a criminal makes one mistake, he may fail and get arrested. A businessman can get, make a lot of mistakes before he goes bankrupt, which is failure in uh, uh, his case. Now, the only place where uh, you might say low intelligence and criminality go hand in hand is in the uh, instance of the, um, well, petty thief particularly. Because he's uh, got low intelligence, he's got low earning power. Then he can't afford the things he wants. If he's uh, got low earning power, he can't afford a car. 
Well, he wants to take his girl to a dance. What does he do? Well, he sees a car sitting somewhere with the keys in the lock, so he just borrows it. Then maybe he drives across the state line. Suppose he lives somewhere like, let's say, in Clinton or Council Bluffs. He goes across the state line pretty easily. Then he gets in some real serious trouble, and there it, uh, it starts. It's, uh, it's a matter there, the criminality being caused by wanting to keep up with others socially, but not having the earning power to uh, do it. So it's an indirect rather than a contributing factor. Well, environment is another one. Now here, just like in our marriage situation, we've got probabilities uh, rather than uh, certainties. For instance, in slum areas, there's more juvenile delinquency and more adult criminality than there is in the uh, nicer suburbs of our uh, cities. But we do get delinquents in the nice suburbs, and after all, there's no slum neighborhood that's so bad that as many as 50% of the kids become uh, delinquents. Uh, one of the worst areas in Chicago, around the steel mill district, just 30% of the kids became delinquents. Now, in contrast to that, one of the uh, wealthy suburbs, 1% became delinquent. So you could say living in a slum area versus uh, more or less of a millionaire suburb created a 30 to 1 uh, uh, ratio for, for becoming delinquent. Now, um, broken homes uh, uh, cause delinquency likewise. Not because, now by broken home we mean divorce, one parent dead, and sometimes they speak of a psychologically broken home. For instance, uh, where the father may, after work, uh, come home, eat supper, and then just leave for the evening, night after night. Uh, where the mother may be one of these bridge fiends that plays all afternoon, then again all evening, and neglects the uh, children. That's a broken home just as much as if she uh, wasn't uh, there. Well, uh, certain other <coughs> factors, uh, such as, uh, what about the personality of the criminal? Now, actually, you find that the criminal tends to be more neurotic than uh, others. He has a low score in self-confidence in a test. Sometimes his criminality or delinquency, as one case I mentioned a couple of weeks ago showed, came to prove he was a man. Uh, there may be senseless petty thievery on the part of somebody with low talents just to uh, boost his own uh, ego. Um, well, as you might expect, uh, the ethical evaluation of the individual is relatively uh, low. Another thing is that they don't face squarely their own capacities and capabilities. The, the typical criminal will not admit it's his own fault. He fell in with a bad gang or his parents drove him out of the home or uh, he got railroaded or something or other. Rarely will he say, it is my fault. Now one trouble uh, there too about reforming the, the <coughs> reforming the individual is uh, that uh, he gets in with a bad gang in prison. Maybe previously he's made a lot of money by this thievery and it's, uh, it's pretty routine to work hard for a dollar an hour or so and earn his living uh, honestly. Well, I'm afraid our time is up. On uh, Monday, what I want to deal with is a kind of a broad topic of uh, the well-adjusted personality and getting along with people in general. And then Wednesday, as you probably recall, we're having an additional session with just kind of questions and answers. So any letters that have come in, I've got in 20 or 30, we'll do our best to answer. Good afternoon. This has been another lecture in the College Teleclass Series, Psychology 204, with Dr. Richard W. Husband. Presented by WOI-TV in association with the Iowa State College Department of Psychology and the Division of Science.